Imagine if you lived in a world where you were constantly watched. A world where everything is controlled by the elite, where you're bombarded with non-stop propaganda. A world where everyone is repressed, lonely and isolated, existing as one insignificant cog in an incomprehensible machine. This is the chilling vision of the future that George Orwell put forward in his masterpiece 1984. And does it sound familiar? It's no coincidence that his predictions have come true in nearly every single way in our modern society today. So let's take a deep dive into the story of 1984 to learn how you're being being controlled, and if you can ever break free. Now the movie begins with a quote from the iconic book that it was adapted from, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past, and this sets the stage. And then without delay, we are then shown the iconic shot of a crowd of people staring at propaganda presented by the party. The party is the shadowy government which controls every aspect of life through their ideology in SOC. The basic principle is to control information so tightly that every aspect of life is dictated and controlled by the party. Absolute obedience is expected, down to rejecting basic facts about life and even your own thoughts and memories. On the screen, a video player is creating an idyllic image of the country that the West has become, all under this totalitarian rule, Oceania. This is one of the three super states which make up the world of 1984, with control over the Americas, Britain, Australia, and some parts of Africa. And this is when we're introduced to the concept of Big Brother, and a man named Goldstein, who attempts to persuade the people of Oceania that they are being duped. But despite the truth in what he's saying, it's drowned out by shouts from the audience. Ing Sok has conditioned them to reject the truth entirely, to the point they don't even want to hear it. Throughout the demonstration, you can see the Inzok salutes, something that was borrowed from historical totalitarian regimes. And after this propaganda video reaches its climax, the crowd is pacified by the symbol of Inzok, alongside the face of Big Brother. It's afterwards that we're introduced to our main character, Winston Smith, who is working in an office cubicle for the Ministry of Truth. His job is to edit past broadcasts to reflect the current reality that they're pushing. So if the sugar ration has been reduced from last year, he will then edit last year's paper to imply that it actually went up instead. And then once he's finished with his day's work, Winston makes his way back home, where propaganda has already been played in his house. This time it's a man being shamed for falling under Goldstein's influence. The man has been charged for attempting to persuade the public that they're not at a war with Eurasia, but rather East Asia. This information control and Eurasia is central to Big Brother's control of the people, as over time, the party has rewritten reality to suit their needs. Now Winston is a key part of this process, but obviously this brings up contradictions. And that's where the concept of double thing comes in. The idea of wholeheartedly believing in two separate contradictory facts. One of the examples they give in the novel is the simultaneous belief that the party is a bastion of democracy and also that democracy is impossible. And it's through this concept that the party rewrites reality, replacing it with an illusion of their own creation. And this is the all-encompassing lie that maintains 1984 society. It's only through everyone believing it that it becomes real. But this concept of a world founded on fiction isn't something that Orwell created all by himself. Instead, this is something that's very real and has been observed throughout history. Thousands of years ago, Plato wrote some of the first recorded philosophy on this concept, through what he called the noble lie, where people know their place in society through their belief in an entirely fictional story about the society's origin. The details aren't important, so long as it gives justification for the social order. And this gives people a reason to accept how the world is, and that their equal man is somehow better or worse than him. And we see this today, when our own version of Big Brother says one thing and then means another. Like when the establishment media, politicians and World Economic Forum claim to be working for freedom and free speech, or while doing everything they can to bully and censor all criticism into silence. And there are just countless examples of this, like when the fattest, most grotesque politicians of them all claim that they're promoting health. And this concept has evolved over time as people realize that all of society's institutions are built upon a necessary fiction, and this is known as the habitus. It's the veil you need to see through for society to make sense. Now the concept is similar to the noble lie, but the habitus goes much deeper. You see, throughout your life, you were influenced by your environment and your interactions with other people, and these combined with your personality create your view of the world, and it's in this way that you buy into the habitus, the shared societal illusion of how the world should be. You were socialized into the habitus. It's come down from above and everyone else around you believes in it. The habitus is the social contract between you, your fellow man and the government. And it's what determines your culture. It's what determines all the societal trends around you and therefore also decides the rules of society. And this stretches to everything, our ideas of beauty, what's seen as valuable, what's seen as even right and wrong. But because it's influenced by the environment and how people treat each other, the habitus is always changing to reflect this. And the world of 1984 operates on a habitus. 
The problem with the 1984 Habitus is that it's been cracked at the top and severely deformed, and because it's been poisoned at the top, it's trickled down into all elements of society. And this is why 1984 is so scary. In fact, 1984 is far more unsettling than any dumb horror film because it's so realistic. We all instinctively know what the future could be like because we're so close to it today. Our society that we live in right now is just a few steps away from totalitarianism, and Orwell was trying to warn us of all of this. Because throughout the story, we're going to see exactly how the party has warped the habitus and society, and how it's affected everyone within the society. So getting straight back into the story, and we see Winston sitting alone in his decrepit apartment. And it's here after lighting a cigarette that Winston introduces us to the concept of thought crime. Now thought crime is the act of going against the habitus of the world. Even in your deepest thoughts, just considering rebellion is already rebellion because it's something outside of the party's reality. The party enforces this through the Thought Police, a secret organization which uses informants, surveillance, and undercover agents to root out anyone who even thinks about rebelling. And as the propaganda continues playing in the background on the ever-present screen, Winston lifts a brick from his house and uncovers his journal, something that's definitely banned in the world he lives in. And it's in this journal that Winston reminisces about a world where thought was free, a time where minds weren't controlled by Big Brother and the Thought Police. And by doing this, he's already become a thought criminal just through his own memories. And upon waking up the next day, Winston is then subjected to a mandatory exercise routine in front of his television, to which he is signaled out for not performing adequately. Winston then half-heartedly waves the insoc hand signal and makes his way to work. And that's when he's treated even more propaganda playing on the television during lunch hour. However, what instead catches the eye of Winston is a young woman staring at him. Winston then sits down and begins eating his meal. 